Praise the Lord, everyone. Well, I appreciate this opportunity, and uh, I guess I need to thank someone for putting my name in the hat. I uh, I don't know if I've been wanting to thank them all along or not. I, they talk about this being a hot seat, and if I'm standing here today, uh, just in my own natural ability, this would be very difficult. I can't do it. I don't have the natural ability for this, but we represent a great truth that gives us great courage. Hallelujah. And so we're not very fearful because of that reason. I like what's happening here. I really do. My vote is that we do it again next year right here. A lot of questions being asked over the past few months. What's this all about? What are they doing? Who is this steering committee? What are they driving? Who's on board? Where are we going? Who designated them? Well, perhaps it was the Holy Ghost. I, I know most of these men pretty closely, and I have great confidence in them. And so, this is the result. And truly, we're living in critical times. Amen. Generally, we start with a verse, but if you don't mind standing just a little while, I'll be standing longer than you. I'm going to try to keep in mind... Brother Jackson is going to be following me and try not to get into his time. I have enough here on my platter for all day, but we, we won't do that, Lord willing. I want to speak to you today, and if any of you have ever heard me address this with this title, I just apologize. But this is what I feel today. And uh, I call these thoughts today the Prime Meridian. The prime, the prime meridian. When I first learned the word meridian many, many years ago, I saw it on highways and it said, stay off the meridian. And uh, I always pictured it as the space between two highways. And come to find out that uh, this, this is ground zero, the prime meridian. And uh, rather than keep you guessing where my direction is, I, I believe that the oneness of the Godhead is the prime meridian. Uh, meridian is a thing that divides. Our prime meridian in the, in the world is located in Greenwich. That's how they pronounce it. It's spelled Greenwich, Greenwich uh, right out of London. And politically, that line has been established. There was a time that Germany had her prime meridian, France had hers, England had hers. Practically all the nations had their own private prime meridian, which caused great confusion at high seas. And uh, politically, it's only been a few short years ago, that uh, the whole world got together and decided to adopt Greenwich as the prime rating of the world. And not only is it of all the high seas, but actually all the surveyors and all the coordinates of every port and every island. And in fact, the corners of your property is all based on the prime meridian. It's ground zero. It's not just for Earth, but it has a lot to do with space travel where time is so critical, where if they split a second into many thousands of parts, the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, and Greenwich Mean Time is the zero time of the whole wide world, and even in space. Set up on an atomic clock, 
That doesn't mean it's an atomic generator, but when the old escapement system was replaced with better watches and uh, into the crystal, certain vibrations. I remember when Bullet will come out with one they call the Acrotron, the tuning fork, and uh, it took the cycles, divided the second into many parts, and then the quartz watch came and did much better than that. And now the atomic, you take the, actually take the vibrations of the atom, speed of light. The atomic clock is not accurate. It is not absolute accurate. It's off. Light travels at 186,000 miles a second. That's almost eight times around the world in a second. That's moving out. And the amount of time it takes for light to travel three feet, that's how much the atomic clock is off. And so you can pretty well count on it. Thank you, man. said, we get rid of them ragged edges. We want it right. Hallelujah. For one verse so that you can be seated, I know that's what you're waiting on. That's when we all, oh boy, it'll be exactly quarter after. John 1, 1 John 5 and 19. Just portions of these scriptures is all I'm going to be touching. It said, we know that we are of God. We know that we are of God. And you know the rest of Scripture. But I like the positive part of it. We know that we're of God. I have no doubt that we have truth. It's forever settled in my soul. It's a revelation. It always amuses me when people try to tell in articles what we believe. I just hate for them to do our talking. Amen. We know that we're of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. Many years ago, Brother Terry had a little school at our church. He appointed himself the instructor. Had several young preachers there. And he said, I want to teach you how to preach. First lesson, get them all lost. sounds cruel and it's certainly not politically correct but we have far too much political correction or we're weary with it it's we're weary with it in our politics they can talk for a long time and you still don't know what they said sad to say we're living in critical times and these politically correct orators have allowed this caution to dilute the power of our message. Just afraid to say it. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. And I somehow got a feeling there's very few troublers here today. I feel like we're here in the name of truth. Love of truth. First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians 4, 3. But if this gospel be hid, and it is, who is it hid to? It is hid to them that are lost. And we should be ever grateful that it isn't hid from us. And never rejoice that they're lost. We love Trinitarians. We hate their doctrine. If we hope to save them, I'm going to get all out of place here with my own thoughts, but I've got to say it now. If we hope to save them, we cannot stroke them. 
that encouraged them. And lay our hands on them and pray blessings upon them. Give them our sanction. Can you imagine the great prophets of old giving sanction to the prophets of Baal? And stroking them? Trading pulpits for the prophets of Baal? Can you imagine the apostles doing that? Can you imagine God being pleased with us if we do it? Second Thessalonians, for that day shall not come, except there come a great falling away. And uh, I believe in end time revival, always have, we're still having revival. People are still getting Holy Ghost at our church. Baptistry hardly dries out till we're wetting it again. But I guess I'm a naysayer when it comes to what's being projected as the great sweeping revival. That all of the charismatics that receive the Holy Spirit... Just part of that revival. I'm a naysayer, I'm sorry. You're going to have to get it just like we got it. Brother Gross made mention of the bridges that are being built. I know you're standing, you know that, I always know it. Would you like to be seated? Why well, don't you be seated? All right. Sometimes they tell us, sit down. Well, we sit down. He made mention of the bridges that are being built between us and them. And I like his comment, always suggest water, usually when you think of a bridge. Sometimes you have a bridge over a dry gulch, but most of the time we're thinking about it. Water and I, I don't know. My mind went back to uh, there was a great water crossing at one time when Israel was trying to get across the Red Sea. You know, our God could have built a bridge there if He'd have wanted to, but uh, He chose to not mess up the types and the shadows, and they went through the water. <laughs> they didn't bridge it. And when Joshua was confirmed, his leadership, when the feet of the priests got in the water, didn't, didn't bridge it again. If we go to them, we'll have to go through the water. I don't know how we'd do that, deny our baptism, I suppose. God have mercy on you if you do. But if they're going to get in the body of Christ, they're going to have to get in the water. We're not going to jump it. This politically correct thing goes us a little now and then. I, I think one time a couple of young men came to me and they were picking at me. And uh, they wanted to know the difference between uh, diplomacy and compromise. And they asked me that question challengingly before a lot of other preachers. And... Uh, I knew they were challenging, and I loved them, and I didn't want to get nasty. I just asked them a question. When, when are we ever justified as called of God preachers not to be or to use diplomacy? And they couldn't answer that. I guess what they were saying is we need to be hateful. We don't have to be hateful, but we certainly have to be firm. Something happened that was kind of odd, I think worthy of mentioning, and I, I hope I do it right. I don't want to hurt, hurt anyone saying this, but a group of men were on a bus over in Israel, and the bus was filled up with Jesus' name preachers and Trinity preachers, and they had a time. 
And one of the Trinity came up to one of our men, a good man, too, believes our truth. And uh, he asked him, he said, I haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, and I don't believe in the oneness of the God did. Am I your brother? Well, this gentle man of whom we all love, if I mentioned his name, you would love him. And he was trying to figure out a way to respond to that question. And Brother Terry came up and he said, What kind of question are you having trouble with? <laughs> so there's a defiant time for diplomacy. So he put the question to Brother Terry. I haven't been baptized in Jesus' name. I don't believe in the oneness of the Godhead. I believe in the Trinity. Am I your brother? Brother Terry said, that's easy. No. <laughs> it's been a number of years, way over 20 years ago, that question was posed on a national radio program. And the question was not answered. And uh, it would have been easy enough for me to answer it, and I could have still been nice, I believe. But uh, where were we? We were on naysayers. I don't want to be naysayer to everything. I don't want to be a naysayer to this effort. I like this effort. Second Corinthians 3 and 12 Seeing then that we have such hope. Oh, 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 God. Such hope. It's a beautiful thing to have hope. And it's a beautiful thing to know where we where our hope lies. Praise God. And uh, the conclusion here is because we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Never an excuse to be hateful. Or mean spirited. We don't justify that. We don't. We don't encourage that. But we do encourage truth. And so, borrowing a little, I, we've heard some great preaching, Brother Garrett, and Brother Gross, Brother McDonald, Brother Lambert. Took me a while to catch Brother Lambert's drift last night, but when I caught it, I'll never forget it. I answered some questions, didn't I? Concerning our prayers. Just commenting on it, I feel the Spirit of the Lord. And I've already into this a little bit deeper than I. But let me say this. I wanted to borrow a few things from Brother Garrett. Uh, primarily his primary thought. <laughs> and he used uh, a safe place that you're standing on holy ground we are on holy ground in this doctrine that we love and it is a safe place he mentioned the six cities of refuge which was wonderful particularly if you're running for your life and you find the welcoming arms <laughs> of truth, and then fear leaves you, and the devil cannot torment you, and you can sleep well at night. And it just come through my mind a few things that I wanted to mention just briefly. This is not on my subject, but it's it, we just have one subject. If we're going to preach Christ and Him crucified, we're all in the same boat. And I really do believe that that ought to be the prime uh, mover in our lives is Christ and Him crucified. Now, I thought of some people that must have felt mighty, mighty secure and in a very, very safe place. When God said, I'm going to come through the land, and we call it the death angel, and that's not exactly right, but... That's what we say so often. 
And they said, uh, I want you to kill a lamb. Catch his blood. A lot of qualifications on that lamb. And I don't have time for all of that, as you know. But that blood went on the doorpost and the lintel of their houses that night. And then they went in the house and stayed there. And when that dark, shadowy thing called death came and hovered for just a moment, perhaps in front of every door, those inside were in a safe place. Only safe place on the block is where the blood is applied. Hallelujah. This is our message. Who, who, who has the authority to compromise the eternal truth? Who would somebody, how big would somebody have to think they are that they could compromise the only safe house that there is? Hallelujah. Beneath or behind that blood, they were perfectly safe. And nothing outside of that blood was safe at all. No stroking there. No encouragement to the Egyptians. Have faith. Whether well, the Egyptians knew or didn't know, it did not matter. There's this thing called no light. This gospel is hid. It's hid to them that are lost. And there is light. And nobody's ever turned it out. Hallelujah. I thought of another safe house. I better move. I'm going too slow. When the walls of Jericho were destined to fall, there was a red rope hanging out of a window. It represented the blood of Jesus Christ. And Rahab and her family was in the only safe house in the city. The positive part was it stood. Based on nothing but the promise. And the evidence that was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> no, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in, in spending the night in somebody else's house. Well, there's 
so much I'd like to say right there, but I better quit on that one. Hallelujah. You know what? I want? If, if I got, you know, just reckless. I probably don't need to get reckless. I think you already know that this great dialogue is not going to set right with us, with those of us who believe this message. Hallelujah. You're talking about a great revival and they could be right in the middle of a falling away and not even know it. I want to talk about one other little thing. There was a thing that God had going in Israel. All those types of shadows were so beautiful. They all had a, a lesson for the bride. All those things happened to them. It was imposed upon them. God didn't even mind doing that. He had us in mind. They went through so many gruesome things so that we would know we're right. So many milestones to encourage us and give us hope. One of those that I won't take time on it to go into detail. You're preachers and preachers' wives and preachers' kids. And so you already know most of it. Most of us do. That there was a thing that happened for the waters of separation in the Old Testament. I like the term. Waters of separation. It was for the one that was in a house or a tent when someone died and they were declared unclean. I don't want to get technical. It was one of those hygiene things that God had going. Why they couldn't eat pork that God knew it wasn't good for you. This was for us. And when you get close to death, sin is death. Sting of sin. The sting of death is sin. And they were declared unclean. If a lid was left off of a vessel, it was unclean. Anybody that come in contact with a corpse was unclean. If you were walking and you happened to step on a grave, you were unclean. You didn't mean to step on that grave. They taught me when I was a boy, we'd go to the cemetery, don't step on the headstones. To this day, I won't do it. I wonder if it's a spillover from this. If you were walking in the field, if you stepped on a grave, you were unclean. If you were walking on a field and happened to step on a bone of a human, you were unclean. And so these were all casual sins that people didn't go out and deliberately get mixed up in. Nevertheless, they were unclean. I didn't ask for the sins of Adam, but I got them. But I got rid of them. I, I went through the waters of separation. Hallelujah. And that separated me. It was a double cure. Got rid of Adam's inherited death. And got rid of my own. <laughs> So a heifer was burned, a red heifer, suggestive of the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't want to go into too much detail and try to prove it. You already know it. And the residue of all of that offering, it, it resided in the ashes. The power of the sacrifice was in the ashes. And when someone come to be washed, the ashes went in the water. And the water went on the guilty. And they were separated. They were declared clean. A lot of details here, but that's the basics of it. No water. No application. No ashes. No power. Water alone won't do it. It had to be the ashes of a specific sacrifice. The ashes of the red heifer. It was there even way after the smoke had cleared the sky. Long, maybe months. But our message last night, God's a God of eternity. And when those ashes went 
I'm the one that needed to be washed. It was as though the heifer was still being burned. It was as though it was alive that very moment because all the power of those ashes were, or, or the sacrifice was in those ashes. A type, a suggestion. Hallelujah. That when Jesus died, so many thousands of years or hundreds of years ago, it's so much alive today, it's as though <laughs> we're living in that instant. Time machine, yeah, I guess so. You take someone to the water, and if you don't put the ashes in, there's no washing. All the power of Calvary has been invested into the name of Jesus Christ. And neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved. It's a lie. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's not true. You don't like me say lie? Well, it isn't true. No name was given. No name in the water. No name. No washing. No cleansing. No separation. That's the negative part of it. That's why we can't stroke it. There is a generation that's pure in their own eyes. But they have not been washed from their filthiness. They don't want washing. The positive part of it is, <laughs> for me, I can still hear the water running in my memory. I can still hear that old Texas voice. <laughs> it's as though it was just an instant ago. And it worked. Because I heard the name go in the water and it worked. I wasn't any better than anybody else. May not have been any worse than anybody else. We're all on the same boat. You must be born again. Now, I want to say this about Martin Luther. If Martin Luther wasn't born again, he's lost. Somebody said he, he didn't have the light. Well, what was he doing fighting it if he didn't have it? He had it. It was there. He rejected it. Now, if in the last, and it wasn't recorded, he was baptized in Jesus' name and got the Holy Ghost, then we'll see him in heaven. But if the ashes didn't go in the water, if the name wasn't in the water, Martin Luther, whether he knew it or not, if he could make it without the new birth, then you can today. I'm afraid of those that say Martin Luther made it. A whole lot more of Martin Luther. It, it, there's no, it's a chain reaction. You can't stop it. We got to put it right where the prime meridian is. Thank God. Well, Lord, I may not ever get. Oh my! Oh, I can't believe it. Can't believe it. You'd like to be seated. Huh? Something I talked about at one time a few months ago, years ago, maybe. I read a little book, and I called it the oh, whole. Well, the book called its name The White Tiger. And I've got to go through this quick. I haven't even got the prime reading. This white tiger, I think I've already gotten there. All right. But this, this white tiger was not a tiger. It wasn't a cat. It was talking about an avalanche that took place over in the high Alps. Quick, I'm going to go quick. Beautiful little city that's been there for hundreds of years. Snow had fallen every year. And... Snow banks had piled up several feet deep 
no threat. A little action up at the top of the mountain, people were safe. Because up at the top of the mountain where the unstable snow was, very, very unstable, there, there was a forest of trees. And it was the line of first defense against the avalanche that was always threatening because every year it happened. But the people were in a safe place because there was that forest of trees. And as it always seems to, if your money comes into the picture, somebody wanted to get rich. And, you know, we, a lot of things are sold out for money. Lives are being told so offerings can be taken. Yeah. Statistics are being stretched uh, uh, ridiculously so that offerings can be taken. Money, oh God, it's the root of all evil, the love of it. So they cut the timber. And so the next year, the tragedy happened. The unstable snow began to move, and, and there were no trees there to stop it. And then, as it moved, those millions of tons, and it hit the area that possibly was fairly stable, possibly would have never gotten any problem from that area of the mountain, but it couldn't take that. And it moved. And naturally, no one could outrun it. It was too quick, like a tiger. And so the whole village was buried and practically everyone was killed. Buildings were moved and bridges were moved. Nothing looked like it did before. When they come to survey it later, well, I've got to stop long enough to say that the ministry of this truth is standing against the avalanche. When they take away our... And they hand it to a politically correct orator who's afraid they've cut the timber. <laughs> Say, don't be hateful. I'm not. It's factual. You want to get used again? If that means anything to you. Just don't say it. So our young people come up. Oh, that's how you get to be popular and famous. You just don't say it. <laughs> this has taken years to log this mountain. But when it's all over and everybody looked at the waste and the mountain looked nothing like it did before, all the familiar landmarks were gone, except those areas where there was an outcropping of stone. And it wasn't changed. The terrain was the same. If I want to build my house, I want to build it on a rock. And if the rest of the world is swept away, what is that rock? Well, the prime point of that is the oneness of the Godhead with absolutely no compromise whatsoever. We didn't write it. We can't compromise it. And if we quit believing it, there's still one God and only one. If we all get together and decide that it's not the popular message, we must be popular. Yeah, all we did moved ourselves out of the safe house. I want to be in the safe house. Hallelujah. And so this is the pivotal point of every doctrine that we preach. Hey, we got a lot of fronts that we're watching out for. Yeah, we could talk about holiness, and we do, and we're going to. Yes, sir. You go to our churches, you can see it's being preached. But that in itself is not enough. <laughs> oh, no. You've got Mormons in our country. Their dress is a dragging their tracks out. 
They don't even have hairpins, some of them. They don't wear makeup. That won't save you in itself. And so the prime meridian. How much time do I have? Another 15 minutes or so? I want it a little more specific. I shouldn't have even let that bother me. Huh? Well, you, you kind of know the way I'm going. This is the prime doctrine in our lives. We don't have it. We don't have the authority to compromise it. If you do, you, you just put yourself out. Because this is an everlasting truth. There's only one God, never been more than one God, and never will be more than one God. And there's never been but one person in that Godhead. Never been but one person in that Godhead. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Things are turning in people's minds now. But let me say it again. This is where I stand. <clears throat> if you stand somewhere else, I, I feel sorry for you. But there's never been but one person. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. He was from her seed. He is our dear kinsman. And if you deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. He's Mary's baby. The son of David. Of the seed of Abraham. Otherwise we have no near kinsman. He is the mediator between God and man. We believe that. Hallelujah. Oh, how precious is this truth when you see it. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> oh, what a friend we have in Him. <laughs> oh, God. Thank You for coming, Lord. We couldn't have been saved without His sacrifice. <laughs> Amen. The Lamb of God <laughs> came and died in our place. Oh, hallelujah. This is the prime meridian. And uh, if you'd like to be seated, I, I got here, uh, I just kind of snatched it out of the air. It's, it's a large ball, and I, I want to make it out of styrofoam because I'm going to push an arrow through it at the south pole. I'm going to push this arrow, and it's going to come out at the north pole. And if it was an ordinary beach balloon, it would go flat. So this is a styrofoam ball. And imposed upon this is uh, an outline of our continents. And we have the United States, North America, South America, Greenland, Europe. You know, India and around Japan and back up Russia. And we, way down underneath, we got uh, New Zealand and what's the other one? Australia. And we got the North Pole, Ice Cap, South Pole, Ice Cap. We, we got the, you get the point. And as we push this arrow through, uh, then we take the arrow and we tilt it 23 and a half degrees. God had a plan in that too. But we point that arrow to the North Star. And as it begins to rotate, once every 24 hours, it makes a rotation. It's traveling a little over 1,020 miles an hour at the equator. That's moving on. That's uh, a mile. That's that's about a little over a quarter of a mile a second. All right. So much. We'll get into that later. And it's in an orbit around the sun. And it never quits looking at the North Star. It's at 23 and a half degrees all the time. But, as you can see, twice a year, 
the equator is in direct line as it rotation with the sun. So it's the hottest spot because it has a lot of sun exposure. But in its extremities, when we're pointed this way and the sun's there, the southern hemisphere, now the Tropic of Capricorn, that's the furthest limits of the path of, of the uh, parallel. And then when it moves over to this side, then the northern hemisphere is closer. So we have the Tropic of Cancer. And so these 23 and a half, 23 and a half is 47 degree where the sun is just cooking it. And uh, then we get, that makes weather. That gives us the four seasons, north and south of the equator. There's different heavens in the northern hemisphere than there are in the southern hemisphere. Those in the southern hemisphere have never seen the North Star, and I've never seen the Southern Cross. But sailors that fly the sea uh, often are able to see both the hemispheres. And the heavens are a little different. Uh, they have to sail south instead of north. But uh, it was relatively easy because of latitude, zero point being the equator. And then there's 90 degrees from the equator to the North Pole. That's 90 degrees north. And then there's 90 degrees to the south. That would be 90 degree S or south. And that's divided. Each degree represents approximately 68 miles. And so uh, there were a number of ways that a sailor could tell where he was as far as latitude was concerned. These are parallel lines. But longitude was another thing. Now, they could tell where they were by looking at an almanac and timing the length of the day. That would be one and knowing what day it was. Uh, they could take with their sextant certain angles of various heavenly bodies. And, and because it was so fixed and that arrow never varied from that North Star, it never changed. And they could figure their their latitude pretty easily. Any sailor worth his salt <laughs> was able to calculate latitude. But no sailor. I'm talking about a few years ago before the days of GPS. And uh, no one knew where they were as far as longitude was concerned. Now the earth is divided up into 360 degrees from north to south. And always, there's always, there's also 360 degrees east and west. And where do you start? Well, it was a time that there were many starting places. But there come a day that there was but one recognized the world over and even into space by every nation. And that is Greenwich. These sailors were so lost, they never knew where they were until something happened. Uh, I'm not even going to look at my notes. I, I don't have time to fool with it. And I just hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> In my memory. The Earth's moving on a little over a thousand miles an hour at the equator. It reduces as far as speed and mileage uh, as you go toward the poles. But let's talk equator right now so that we can have some facts. Every hour, the Earth moves 15 degrees. Every hour. It's, you can count on it. If you know how long you've been sitting at a spot, you know how far you've gone in an hour. 15 degrees. Multiply that times 68. If you don't get too lost in math, that interprets to every four minutes, you move one degree at the equator and the world over. But at the equator, that one degree represents approximately 68 miles. A little over 68, in fact, but let's go 68. That's fast enough for anybody. <laughs> and uh, that's four minutes. In two minutes, you went 34 miles. In one minute, you went 17 miles. 
in a minute at the equator. I mean, things are changing. <laughs> You're not just sitting out there at anchor. The world's spinning. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. Every second, little old over a quarter of a mile. Look at your watch. How long does it take for a second to go? You done moved. Well, there was a great catastrophe. I just have one page. I'm going to turn it over, though. In England, in 1707, there was a great sea tragedy. There were five vessels loaded with redcoats, soldiers. They had been down the Mediterranean. They'd had a very, very successful campaign. The British were very powerful. And uh, they were going home. Five huge ships. Over, over 2,000 men died that, that night. And the reason they died was because four of those ships hit the rocky beach, rocky shoreline. Yeah, every navigator and every captain on every one of those ships, only one of them escaped. And I don't know, he probably just was skin of his teeth. But they all thought they were further west than they were because they was going by dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning is a poor guess. It depends on the speed of the vessel and the angle of tack. You could never sail exactly west, rarely. And you had to tack into the wind or from the wind, but... Uh, they would tack north and then south and then north, a zigzag course. And they had to throw a sea anchor over it with a rope tied to it. I don't want to get into the mechanics of all this. But out of a bucket come a rope, and the rope was tied in knots. As the sailor counted the knots, as they went through his hand, another sailor had a little hourglass, a three-minute glass, about the long time it takes to make a good egg. And... In three minutes, they counted the knots. They calculated their speed. Very inaccurate speedometer. And then they had to calculate how, with the progress they made west or east, with uh, using trigonometry and angle. And finally, they were able to, after several pieces of paper and wore out pencils and under the stove of a candle when the ship was pitching. I said, we should be here, based on dead reckoning. But their dead reckoning was off that night, and they plowed into, the, into their death. This was such a tragedy that England got upset. That was in 1707, and seven years later, there was a, a long, the Longitude Act, or the, the Royal Academy of Astronomers, got together and they passed an act called the Longitude Act. Not only was Britain suffering, but every nation was suffering. Treasures going to the bottom, men dying of scurvy, uh, of thirst, and sometimes disease so that they found ghost ships, nobody on them. All primarily attributed to the fact that they were lost. Didn't know where they were. Didn't even know which what direction to go. There were five ships going around the tip of South America and a storm for five days and four of the ships went down because of the storm. One lone ship there was having there in Chile some political problems and it wasn't welcome on Chile's shore. But when they came up and started sailing north, they knew where he knew where he was, that captain knew where he was as far as latitude, but he didn't know where he was in longitude. And when he got to the proper latitude to turn to go to the island that he sought, he sailed west. I believe he sailed for four days, and he thought, I must have turned the wrong way. When you're guessing, man, you don't have any safe house. <laughs> His people were dying every day from scurvy and lack of water. And so he turned around and went back those four days and then went another four days and he saw the coast of Chile. And he realized he'd gone the wrong way. And he turned back and went that four days plus another four days and he's throwing men overboard every day. Barely had enough men to man the sails. All of that waste because he just didn't know where he was. And so it becomes so important. That England offered a king's ransom 
for anybody that could solve the longitude problem. They had all kinds of suggestions. One of them had what they call the powders of sympathy. I'll mention this one. Powders of sympathy. They wrote it in several pages. We have a chemical, it's a miracle drug, that uh, what, what we do here is we have a dog and we, we torture this dog and injure this dog. And then we soak a cloth in the dog's blood. But we don't kill the dog. And we put the dog on board the ship. And it doesn't matter where you are. If we put the powder of sympathy on that bloody rag, regardless of where that dog is, he'll, he'll, is it? They have enough, people can get weird. They didn't even take into account the dog might heal. What do we do, injure him again? It didn't work. Many, many, many applications, but it was Isaac Newton that stood. Never heard of him. And he made this statement. We do not expect to find the answer to the longitude problem, except in two hopes. One is the hopes of being able to someday be able to read the stars while at sea. See, it's almost impossible, because the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. And you take a man, he can't even hardly, he has to strap himself to the mast in order to look at his section. No way to look at the stars and know where you were at sea. That's all I'm going to say there. You want to fuss with that? Try it. Oh yeah, the heavens do rule, but when you're at sea, you don't know what the heavens are saying. Now, on land where they have all the time in the world and a solid place to look at the stars, you know how they just determine the time at Greenwich? is by looking at Jupiter. And when a certain moon appears, they know exactly what time it is. And if the atomic clock stops, they can go look at that moon again. Because the heavens do rule. The heavens do rule. You remember that. We're not in control. And so astronomers saw, and they never really come up with a very good plan. They really, really didn't. They even they put in so much time and so much money and so many, so much talent, cost the government so much money, and they they couldn't establish a way that a sailor would know where he was. But Isaac Newton said, "We have this hope." But I don't offer you any hope because it's an impossibility. That if we had a timepiece, a sea-going clock, that was absolutely accurate, it would solve the problem. Simply because when our ships leave our port, they set their clock to the prime meridian time, Greenwich Mean Time. And it doesn't matter where they are, they don't even have to worry about it. A captain could look at that clock. And then he could look, and the way they could tell local time where they were was uh, they observed the sun and its travel. And when the sun hits its zenith, it's like as if you throw a ball into the air, try it sometime, you'll see it pause just before it comes down. And it's a fact, and don't fuss with me, I read it and I believe it. That sailors could observe the sun. That's why most of them had a patch over one eye. <laughs> Until somebody understood that they could build a box and then look at the shadow of the box. They knew... The instant high noon occurred, they'd set their crude little clock, and then they'd look at their accurate clock. And all they had to do, how many hours separate us from the prime meridian? Every hour is 15 degrees. How many minutes? Every minute is 17 miles. How many seconds? 
every second a little over a quarter of a mile. They would know precisely where they were. And all they would need was a little notepad about the size of a postage stamp. And so John Harrison, master mechanic, finally come up with that. There were some limits. I'm, I'm on, not referring to my notes if I can help from it. The, there was a first prize, second prize, and third prize. First prize was that you could only lose. Maybe I will have to look at my notes. First prize was this trial was to be over a period of 42 days. They couldn't be off but one half of a degree, which would be 34 miles in 42 days. They could be off a half of a degree. That was first prize. That's all we're going to talk about right now. And that only amounted to, I think it was three seconds a day off. Finally, H1 or H4, Harrison 4. He was an old man now. He could have claimed the, the reward many years ago, but he was a perfectionist. And finally, his huge clock that was about 30 inches square and about that high, that weighed nearly 100 pounds, was re and it was accurate. But it was reduced down to a pocket watch about the size of your hand. And it was so accurate. Let me tell you how accurate that was. In 81 days, he only was off five seconds. He could have been off three seconds a day. But in 81 days, he was only off five seconds. A little over a mile and a quarter. <laughs> you could just almost with your naked eye see port with that distance. But they wouldn't give him the reward. This world is cruel. But we're not dealing with this world. We're dealing with God. Hallelujah. What does all this mean? It means that every sailor was lost until he knew where Prime Meridian was. That's what I'm boiling it down to. A lot of men at high sea, we're out there. But we know where Prime Meridian is. We know our relationship to Prime Meridian. What is Prime Meridian? Well, it's the ones of the Godhead. And what is it outside of that? Well, you wouldn't know anything about the power of Calvary if you don't know about the oneness of the Godhead. You don't know about the, the essentiality of Jesus' name in the water if you don't know the Godhead. We cannot afford to weaken on this issue. We must not. We cannot lose prime reading. If this is in poor taste, I ask you to forgive me in advance. I was in a church the other day, a good church. They believed this message. They'd be shouting right along with us. But in that church, there was a young man that he came up to compliment me, of which I always enjoy. But everybody does, I suppose. We want to know we got heard. He said, my wife's sister goes to a church, and he named her it was. He thought he was really telling me something good. And it wasn't. But he said, uh, we went to visit her, Jesus named church, incidentally, quote, quote. And he said, when we got there, the bus was loaded up with the choir. And a whole lot of saints was going to support the choir. And they went to sing in the Lutheran church. And he said, when they got done singing, the people were just happy and thrilled. And a Baptist preacher was preaching that day. And he said, this is the good part. He said, the Baptist preacher got up and said, nobody can sing like Pentecostals. Do you know why? Because they got the truth. <laughs> Man, the whole thing is crazy. It's loco. If they have the truth, partner, why don't you get it? All that is is compliments. All that is is pleasantries. Brother, you can't drag them in the water. I baptized a man many years ago. He was ready for the water. 
I talked to him. He's come back. Well, I was hopeful to baptize him that night. But he had made up his mind without telling me that that night was going to be the night. And he had the keys to the Sunday school bus, Four Square Church. Don't name them. Well, it was a Four Square Church. And he put the keys on the table where the Four Square pastor was sitting. He said, what's this, Brother Sanders? He said, that's Key's Sunday school bus. He said, why are you giving them to me? He says, because I won't be driving it anymore. And he said, and why are you not going to be driving it anymore? He said, because you won't want me to. I said, no, well, why is that? He says, I'm going to get baptized in Jesus' name tonight. That preacher jumped up and slapped the table and said, not that name! You know, Herod got to eat up by worms. He didn't do any worse than that. People don't want this name because it threatens their position. We don't have a position. We only have one position. There's only one safe house. We must teach our people. man left our church for reasons that I suppose he felt justified. Our music was too loud. All right. And I couldn't do anything about it because that's, that's us. Hallelujah. Man, people get anointed in it. People get in the Holy Ghost. And he's sitting back. So he went. I said, it's not a good church you're going to. They're pretty weak. Pretty sure they have television. And he said, I won't get one. I said, you can't stand. You won't make it. He said, I'll get tapes from you preaching every week. I said, you can't make it with that. <laughs> he lasted two years until his he had to swallow a hickory net, not to hold his britches up spiritually. And finally that preacher got up. It's been about an hour or so. Finally that preacher got up and he preached on the ones that God did. And my, my good brother that I love and I see him every now and then. He's going on. He's a good church now. But he went up to shake the preacher's hand. Thank you for preaching on the ones that God did. And the preacher, he didn't do this. All right. I'm, I've got to be honest. He didn't do this. But in a way he did this. I try to preach on the ones that God had at least once a year. He didn't do that, all right. That's being unkind, but that was his attitude. Sufficient. That's all we need. One man told me, he said, I thought he was pastor. He wasn't pastor in church. But he said he leaned over the pulpit and he said to me, we were just the two of us, he said, I'll never preach this one God. Because be careful, Paul. I'll never preach this one God message across my pulpit. I said, why? He said, it's too offensive. And I said, well, uh, how you plan on winning anybody? He said, over cake and coffee. And I said, how long you been there? And he said, eight years. And I said, how many people have you won? And he said, well, really, we got six, but four of them are Mormons. So you know where he was. He's in Utah somewhere. And I said, you see these people? They were one over this pulpit. Not once a year. Not even once a week, but just practically daily. And you get up in the morning, teach them. Hero Israel. When you're walking at noon, you teach them. Hero Israel. And when you lay you down at night, Hero Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Our little children, little bitty babies. How many gods are there? One. That's us. That's us. We cannot afford to change. We cannot afford to soften. We can't.
cannot afford to weaken. No, we don't need dialogue. We need monologue. And I'm not being hateful. I am not. But I do believe that if we ever lose this prime meridian church, not only will you be lost and your church be lost, but any potential convert will not make it. I wasn't in Las Vegas for just a few weeks and we're moving our house. I'm going to quit just a minute now. And one of my nephews had a little fishing pole, a little real cheap stuff. And I took it out that morning. And I took my scissors and I cut the hook off. It had a sinker. had a reel. And man, it had everything there. And I asked some of the kids, I said, how many fish do you think I'm going to catch today? And those little kids said, I ain't going to catch no fish. I said, Why? They said, you just cut the hook off. <laughs> we can't lose this message. It's our hope. It's our safe house. And anybody you hope to win, it is their safe house. Let's never forget, never forget the prime meridian. The oneness of the Godhead. Love it. The Prince of Peace is He. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose, said William Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice. There are many out there who simply use one scripture to teach on baptism. Two noted examples, the Trinitarians use Matthew 28, 19 out of context for their baptismal formula. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And the Church of the Latter-day Saints or Mormons use 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to baptize for the dead or what is called baptism by proxy. What else shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? However, we find that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. This was necessary under the law in the Old Testament. We read in Deuteronomy 17.6, At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And in the New Testament, Paul repeated this same principle. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Every single apostle used Jesus' name baptism as their sole name in their formula. Examples are the following scriptures. Mark 16, 15 through 17. Luke 24, 45 through 47. John 20. 23, Acts 2.38, Acts 8.12-16, Acts 10.48, Acts 18 and 8, Acts 19 and 5, Acts 22.16, 1 Corinthians 12.13, Romans 6, 3-5, Galatians 3 and 27. So nobody ever used a misapplied title baptism of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's because they knew the name of the Father was Jesus and the Son was named Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was sent in Jesus' name. Peter said unto those people in the book of Acts that they should save themselves from this ungodly generation. That's in Acts 2.40. Are you willing to follow the word of Jesus and the faith of the apostles? Or be like those on the day of the Lord who claim Jesus was theirs, Yet they are cast away because they were still in sin. In Matthew 7, 21-23. God bless you as you obey His word.